Hey, everyone. Um, this is your supplemental um, video. So this is essentially the material from week five that we were unable to go through. Um, and so I, I want you to just enjoy it um, as much as you can. Um, I'm just going to go through some things primarily about the evaluation and we will hit the statistical, fun statistical stuff next week when we meet in person. So I want to remind you, I did talk about the just kind of how the CQA assignment will be graded, um, that it will essentially be, was there a relatively thorough attempt to answer the question and its subcomponents based on the article? So about, I'm looking for a paragraph, not like a two sentence paragraph, but like, you know, four or five sentences, maybe two paragraphs if you really want to go for it. And then was there an attempt to integrate or rely on what we learned in class so far, which is not a lot, right? So your first attempt at the CQA may not have um, a lot of um, class material. And then um, I also wanted to let you know, you asked me um, whether there was a how-to resource for evaluations. It's a really great question, right? Like if you wanna conduct an evaluation that's not your dissertation or on a program or even for your evaluation. So in our articles fo folder, I uploaded an article um, that is a short kind of how-to for evaluations. It's very short, and it's not necessarily social justice oriented, which is why I use the Martin's article instead of this one. But it's a great little how-to. It's you know kind of a map. Okay, so back to the idea that um, you know in the exercise we did in the discussion, you thought of a program to evaluate, and that that could be your dissertation, but it is not necessarily your dissertation. I wanted to give you a sense of what. Um, you know, if your dissertation is to be an evaluation, like what the parameters would be. So basically, usually there would need to be a specific bounded project or program with particular outcomes. So you might be wanting to evaluate a professional development effort, right? That's a specific bounded program. Or um, maybe it's an outreach effort to parents for involving them in special education decisions. Right, so like there might be a particular a program or a particular project, some, some initiative that's going on that you want to evaluate. And it already needs to be in existence, at least for your dissertation, or it needs to be being planned right now, right? Because you, you would need to have things actually happening during the year of your dissertation to do the research. So I know some of you are very interested in eventually creating a program to address a particular issue and so you're doing research, you'd like to do research to, to, in order to create the best program. That is fabulous. That's a really great dissertation, but it's not an evaluation because the program does not already exist. So hopefully that helps you with thinking about moving forward on your dissertation. And by the way, I am always happy to talk about your dissertations. I know you also have advisory groups, of course, but if you ever want to make an appointment with me, please feel free. So other really great discussion points. Some of you talked about, well, what's the difference between participatory action research and logic models, all right? Um, and Brie brought up, for example, the talent development model could be used as a tool of cyclical evaluation. Um, so that sounds really interesting. I don't know a lot about it, but that might be something interesting to ask Brie about. Victor wrote some great points, right? That, you know, yeah, like this logic model seems very linear, whereas participatory action research is um, cyclical. And um, then he, he saw these similarities, both have goals, right? And both involve considering the intended and unintended outcomes and both begin with a fair amount of planning. So um, all of those are really great answers. Essentially, a logic model can be the foundation of um, the plan part of participatory action research. So these circles here at the bottom, uh, right corner are participatory action research. And you can see here, there is this, um, that's an arrow, there is this thing that says planning action or intervention. So um, before you take action or as you're taking action, sometimes you're doing this, you're creating the logic model. And then as you go around, right, this circle, you are taking action, you're analyzing, um, you're, you're collecting data, analyzing the action or the intervention. Um, you're reporting about the findings, and then you're revisiting the issue, right? 
And then essentially you end up here with the next plan, right? So you're redefining the issue and then you recreate a new plan, which is actually literally a revision of the logic model. So the logic model can actually be a piece of participatory action research. I know my arrows are kind of not very good there. Okay, another question you asked and answered was what is the purpose of the logic model? Like, when do you do it and how is it framed in general research? Also, what is the relationship between a fishbone and a logic model? And I really love your answers. I wanna highlight those and then I will talk a little bit about it. So Katie said, um, the purpose of a logic model is to visualize the outcome or intended purpose of the program to determine if it's actually being achieved. I mean, that's a very clear way to say it. It's absolutely true. The thing is, and I mean, it may seem kind of obvious, but in many cases, people come up with programs without actually clearly articulating the outcomes and the actions and processes by which those outcomes are going to be achieved. And so because of that, it is very hard to know if you've actually achieved the outcomes. Ari wrote, I understand them to be a tool to examine the mechanisms of a program to see how the constituent parts are organized or related and impact one another. I like this because this is also true, especially a theoretically grounded logic model. You are able to see like, well, I'm hypothesizing in some ways that this action is going to affect this um, maybe intermediate outcome, which will then affect this intermediate outcome. And a lot of times there's theory that's connecting those, that's saying engaging in projects is going to increase student engagement and increase student engagement is going to increase achievement or something like that. Bree said, theory-driven evaluation makes visible the inner workings of a program in relationship with the intended outcome. So again, here's the relationships. There's all these moving parts within a program, which it's always good to label because again, many times people do not know what all the moving parts are. And then how is that, how are those related to these outcomes we want? Sometimes there's moving parts or actions that actually aren't very well related to the outcomes and then we can remove them. Or maybe that we are missing actions that are necessary for particular outcomes. And Kim wrote, the purpose of a logic model is to assist researchers with theory-driven evaluation. Nice citation there. Um, logic models are graphic organizers that assist researchers to visually capture the multiple steps necessary to examine whether a program will do what it is intended to accomplish. Um, so yes, right? Like this is an argument also. And it's really important because logic models can be used to communicate to outside constituents and within, right? Like as a tool to understand, like do we all understand what we are doing here? And when I do evaluation, I uh, almost always build a logic model with the participants uh, in concert with them, right? Because I believe in more of a community-based uh, research evaluation. And together we think through, are these actions going to reasonably lead to these intermediate outcomes? What are the mechanisms by which they're doing it? What's the theory and research that underlies that? Are these really the outcomes that, that you want, et cetera, right? So it's a really great way to think through and have everyone be on the same page of what it is this program is and what it's not. So, um, some of the questions you asked had to do with timing. And I loved those questions. I thought they were really wise, right? So ideally, this green one is the ideal, right? The program is created based on theory and research. So in this one, starting on the very left, you start with a fishbone, which I think you've done before, right? So all of the possible barriers, all of the possible issues, everything that's going wrong, like that we need to fix, right? You look at that fishbone and you determine which issue or barrier you want to address. And then you examine the literature. And maybe it's not just research, but maybe you talk to other people about how they might address that. From that research, you devise a logic model, a theoretically driven understanding of what kinds of actions are going to lead to what kinds of outcomes. 
within that, as you create the logic model, you also create a research question so that eventually you know what you're trying to evaluate and how you're evaluating it. Then you create the program, right? Again, this is the ideal timeline. And then finally, of course, as the program is running, you do evaluation. Now, most of the time it happens the orange way where the, oops, um, the evaluation happens after program creation. So a group of really great and smart people engage in creating a program. It's not necessarily clearly delineated with an action model. It's not necessarily based on the literature. Um, then a logic model is created in the process of, you know, you're sort of, you're doing the program and maybe an evaluator comes in and helps you create a logic model and then conducts the evaluation. And that happens quite a lot um, in programs I evaluate. Um, maybe for some of you, I know some of you are in um, jobs where you do evaluation or where you have programs that are evaluated and maybe you are, are doing the first one. It'd be great to hear about it. You could make comments. So um, the research question driving our evaluation, and I'm sorry I didn't come up with these with you, but research questions for evaluation are fairly standard. The first one is to what degree is the program meeting stated outcomes? So we're just going to essentially be measuring these outcomes with the undergraduate student. And the second question, and this is harder to answer quantitatively, but we might ask some open-ended questions, which is what aspects of the program play a key role in these outcomes? So really finding out from students, well, what is it about the program that is leading to certain kinds of outcomes? So, um, Back to the evaluation. Um, oh, actually, you haven't seen this yet. So this is the logic model that um, I created out of the brainstorm we did with Dr. Carpesi. Um, and you can see, I'm, I'm going to pause, you know, you can pause this and really read it. But I'll just, you know, kind of go over the big areas are the pedagogical approach. So there's the head, the hands and the heart. The projects, so in addition to, um, and all of the students, um, Dr. Eric Helgren, the chair of the physics department, um, we went through a, a dialogue, and this is really important in terms of community, right? So I created this out of what they said, but then I sent it to them, and I said, you know, does this work? Is this actually right? What would you take out? What would you add? And so we went through an email dialogue about this, and Dr. Helgren said, that all of the students engage in building solar suitcases and system design, including, you know, large solar system kind of design. So there's a lot, everyone engages in those kinds of hands-on engineering activities. Um, but that the undergraduate students then also each choose a project and then here are the projects. I also talked with them about things like we talked about in class, like do we do, um, do they do a critical education approach, critical pedagogy approach where they, Help to elevate the consciousness of the young woman in the class about um, ways in which they might have been steered away from these kinds of um, engineering and other kinds of STEM in interests, and they said that they do not. So here I am stepping back, even though it's great we brought it up to them that maybe this is something they should think about, but as an evaluator, I have to step back and say, okay, that's not what you're doing right now, so we're not going to put it in as part of the evaluation. Um, but the process of talking about it might raise it to their level of consciousness. Um, finally, this we're hypothesizing leads to maybe a certain kind of classroom climate um, and high student engagement and interest. And then, of course, the content and skill acquisition in a variety of areas, action competence, um, career trajectory. So like they think that maybe people already have chosen their majors, but maybe use outside of class in terms of some of these skills and then student action. And one thing you can think about as you look at this is um, what did I do with those crazy notes in order to translate them into something usable? And this kind of goes back to the idea of writing up the evaluation steps, right? Like, so I did this brainstorm, almost an interview with Dr. Garbesi, and then I had to take it turn it into something usable, and then actually, of course, engage in this back and forth with them to try to make sure that it really works. So think about that um, for a moment. You can even do a little writing if you want to keep up a Google Sheet where you are documenting the steps of an evaluation. 
So um, we are, and I, I mentioned this in class, each gonna be, each group is gonna take on one construct, right? Within this logic model to ask some questions of the students in a survey. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about constructs. That's something that you requested. And um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit more lecture style um, because we didn't end up having class time to do this, but hopefully it's still useful that you're able to get something out of this. So a, a construct or a characteristic to be assessed, right? A construct is a characteristic of what's going on to be assessed, right? And then it's usually assessed through a set of questions. It could be very specific and direct like age, or it could be um, less specific or less directly measurable, like you know, teacher science instructional practices, right? Um, they are another way to think of them as broad concepts or topics for study, but they have to be able to be conceptually defined. And so, for example, I read an article research, uh, recently where they critiqued the construct of attitude. The, the idea of someone's attitude, they argued, cannot be conceptually defined. It's too broad, it's too amorphous. And I agree with them. I'm not very into measures of attitude. Um, but constructs can be abstract. Um, so they can be something like organizational climate and we can really try to get at it and people do, right? They try to like do all kinds of interviews and things to create a survey instrument that gets at something like organizational climate and that really measures something useful. Probably not exactly organizational climate, but maybe something like it. So they can be behaviors. You can ask people about their behaviors. You can ask them about their opinions. You can ask them about their feelings or beliefs or values. You can ask them about their knowledge. Of course, um, constructs can also be content knowledge like um, in an examination. And they can be abstract concepts like self-efficacy. Self um, so I told you in class, each group will be assigned one construct from the logic model. Um, and I am hoping that using the resources you have at hand, um, your, uh, your group will um, construct a definition. Now, I don't expect you to know everything about this uh, construct, but I would like you to use the resources you have at hand. You may look up an article or two. You don't need to read it all the way through. Just kind of extract an idea. You might use the internet and you might also write Dr. Garbesi a question. So I'm gonna make sure that's okay with her and I'll email you about it, but I'm pretty sure it will be fine. So here are the groups. Now remember, I looked through all of your awesome cards with like where you work and you know what you do and your interests to try to assign this, like hoping that there's a little bit of overlap. But if you'd like to you know, be with a different construct or in a different group, let me know. Um, so here are, I'm gonna talk through these. Um, Laquita and Bree, um, I thought you could work with the role of project participation in the outcomes. So you saw in the logic model, there were these lists of projects that students did. If you could get a set of questions together to help students unpack and think about how did participation in their particular project enhance, and remember the outcomes, right? Enhance their engagement, their interests, their career choices, their um, action, you know, their action for the environment, right? So you are asking them about the outcomes, but in relationship to specific thing they did in class, right? And so you might be, have open-ended questions as well as some closed-ended, you know, Likert uh, style. Crystal, Sarah, and Kim, again, thinking about your roles and your um, work and maybe some things you're interested in. Similarly, how about the pedagogical approach of the classroom, this head, heart, hands thing? And this might be difficult, um, you know, I mean, this getting into pedag pedagogy, right? So how do we ask students about pedagogy? One of the things you could look up is um, active learning at, in the college, uh, college level active learning is actually a thing. And um, there are survey instruments out there. So you may wanna look some of them up. Um, and, and see what you can find out there in terms of asking students what kinds of learning occurred in their classroom and then asking them to connect them to particular outcomes. Um, 
Ande, Lynn, and Morgan, I thought you might like to work on student interest and student engagement. Now, there are many student engagement surveys out there, and I actually have an instrument and several papers, so you should write me and I will um, send them to you. Um, classroom climate. So here, Susan, Ari, and Ella, you may want to get together and sort of chat about, well, what, what might be interesting to know about the classroom climate? What do you think the things they're doing might be creating in terms of classroom climate? Is it creating a climate of um, where people feel um, encouraged to um, move across boundaries, right? Um, to, to be brave, as someone so wisely put it in class. Um, is it creating a classroom climate um, where risk taking is um, happening more, right? So, and again, there are definitely papers out there with classroom climate, but you will have to really think about, well, what kind of classroom climate are we interested in here? to ask students about. Now, content and skill, skill acquisition is something that Eric, uh, Dr. Helgren, and Dr. Garbesi are creating because they know the content, of course, much better than we do. Now, use outside of class. So that seems kind of strange thing to say, Kristen, William, and Katie, but what we're thinking about is like, do students apply any of these things outside of class? Do they take some engineering ideas? Do they do any kind of construction? Do they have they increased, um, since we're doing a post survey, have they increased their use of these kinds of skills over the course of the class? And you can ask them these kinds of questions. You may end up needing to email Dr. Garbese to ask her, you know, maybe what are some of the things they might expect to increase over the course of the class. Now, Michael and Salim, I very specifically thought you might be interested in action competence because, um, of the way in which discourse is involved. There are a lot of articles on action competence. Please email me, I will send them all to you. Um, it's an interesting construct in environmental education research. There are a few, uh, there's like one survey, it's not very good. Um, so I want you to, you're gonna be thinking about and creating some survey items around how these students might increase their competence or efficacy or self-efficacy around environmental action. And then Victor and Richard, I thought you might be interested in coming up with some questions for students around, are they engaging in action? Are they actually doing any additional actions after, you know, going through this class, environmental action, action for their community, these kinds of things. Um, so, and again, um, I may not have defined this earlier, but this will be a post survey. So they are in the class right now, and we will have the survey ready for them towards the end of class. All right, so um, once we have, you'll brainstorm, you'll come up with your construct definition. You're gonna brainstorm five to 10 questions. And once we're gonna call them down uh, during next face-to-face -face class. So we're gonna talk about good items, items that may have some issues, and we're gonna get, get them down to maybe, you know, three to five items per construct, all right? Those three to five items, the quantitative ones, hopefully, will be averaged together to create a variable, all right? So variables are created by developing the construct into a measurable form, right? Um, and variables, it has to vary, right? The number, the number created by the variable has to have at least a yes, no. It has to be at least binary, but usually it's like one through five or something like that. So I'm gonna revisit this. And if it's still not clear, um, let's talk about it next time we meet together in class and please make a comment. So um, now we can talk about our evaluation survey, right? We've got construct one might be student engagement. Construct two might be classroom climate. Construct three might be student action competence. Construct four might be use outside of class, right? Those are four constructs we know we're gonna measure and there's four groups that are gonna be working on that. And together, those things are gonna make our measure, our full survey, all right? Each of those constructs, like I said, is gonna have three to five questions. And when we average across those questions, it's going to create a variable, a number that we are going to have in an Excel sheet that we can do lots of fun stuff with. All right, so this was from last time, you know, right? If there's three items, 
it measures a certain kind of thing like feature agency and eventually if we average across those items it will create a number like 3.4 again if this is still confusing please let me know i totally get it this is not um you know sometimes it's like speaking a foreign language and um i want it to be as enjoyable as possible um to um, kind of you know start cracking that door so that we have the power of quantitative numbers. Okay, so again, just a reminder, each group is gonna come up with five to 10 items to measure your focal construct. So you're gonna define it using resources. So you're gonna use the internet, you're gonna use scholarly articles, you're gonna email me, <laughs> I might send you some stuff. You're gonna ask Dr. Garbesi, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Don't agonize over it. And then you'll come up with five to 10 items as you, in your group and you'll bring them to class October 3rd because on October 3rd, we're gonna workshop them. So please, please have them ready to go. Okay, that is it for our supplemental class. Um, I hope you have a fabulous week and I will see you October 3rd.